Amanda said, we're going to talk about all of the different career positions. And I think it's important right at the top to kind of say that, you know, there really is no different with the crew positions themselves from a $100 million film to a $5 million film to a no budget film. The only difference is you have on a very low budget film one person doing five to ten different roles. Um, but the roles still need to get done in order for the film to be successful and to complete it. Like one of my favorite things about um, film is that you can't take one person out of the equation and still make the film. Like every role is so essential to that final product, even down to the PA. Like I always stress to everybody on set, like if you weren't here locking down, if, if, does everyone know what locking down is when you lock a location or you know, they're there waiting to make sure nobody walks through the shot while you're shooting, you know, all the pedestrians on the sidewalk, they say, okay, you know, wait here until we're done shooting, please. Like, if they don't do their job, the shot's ruined and it costs you time and it which translates into money. So like, every single person is so essential to that, yeah. that final product. So, you know, as we're, we're gonna talk about a lot of positions, but do know that in many cases, you're gonna be one person doing doing money. And, and also, too, you know, who does that position? We'll talk through some of the ones that it's important for someone to have. It's like a doctor. Like, if you're going to go into surgery, like, you need a doctor. You can't have someone playing a doctor. But then there are the other positions. Um, I know I've talked um, earlier about some of our budget levels, and even on a $3 million budget. So when we started on my, my first film, which was like, getting donations, like begging people to help us for free. Like it was low budget for what we pulled off. My dad ended up becoming our transportation coordinator. He had never worked on a film set before. I just needed a person that was smart, that could coordinate all of our vehicles, and we'll go into that a little bit more. My mother did extras casting. So I'm not standing up here talking you know, about this with no experience, having to like literally ask my family members so, you know, they learned a lot, and I'll tell you, on the second film, which was like, we actually did have all the roles and had professionals, my dad still did do transportation, and my mother still did extras. Of course, I don't call them mom and dad on set, like, you know, like, hey, Sue, like, isn't that your mom? I'm like, I know, but that doesn't sound professional. <laughs> Sue and Bill. But, um, so, you know, these are just the positions that get to get done, to have to get done, but it might be your cousin, or your brother, sister, or your neighbor, so that's what we're gonna, we are going to talk about. Sounds good. So where should we start? Let's start at the very beginning. At the top, and then we can come down and discuss the chain of command um, in that regard. So I think that if you talk from the international level, and then I can always just kind of bring it home and say, see that you might have five persons in one department, I can then give an example of what really happens down here. And we can kind of do that. Yeah, well let's start with the, um, let's start with the leaders, because it's very important that, um, those that are in charge, which are usually your producer and your director, there is a trickle down effect that happens with those two positions um, that affects the whole rest of the crew. And that's from morale to their leadership style. You know, if you have a director that's constantly yelling at everyone and really stressed and anxious, that's going to trickle down. So those are like the two most important roles. But something that we're also going to talk about later on is the chain of command because if everybody is constantly going directly to the director or the producer with their questions, it's gonna be very hard for them to do their job. So I think that's also another reason that defining all of these different positions and what that chain of command is that will help your, your set run smooth by understanding what everyone does and who should be reporting to who I think is, is gonna be key. So you start with the director, right? And that is the the, the person that ultimately is driving the creative vision of the project. You know, ultimately it's it's their vision and they're gonna work with each of the department heads to make sure that those department heads are supporting that vision. And it's important that as you hire all crew positions that everyone really understands what is the vision of the project. You know, what is the tone? A lot of times directors will have projects that they'll reference, you know, this is gonna be kind of Tarantino-esque. Tarantino shoots very different than someone shooting a Hallmark film, you know? So all the crew understands just coming in that simple concept. It's gonna clue wardrobe and makeup and all the other departments into, you know, how this is going to be shot. So the director ultimately is the one that, I don't wanna to have to talk too much about that. They have the vision. 
and then it's up to them to communicate that vision to each of the departments, um, trickling down. Um, and then of course the producer is the one that really should ultimately have the eye on the budget. And you know when you're and, and, and budget meaning the decisions that might not have money behind them, but you know where are you going to spend your time and energy, you know moving moving forward. And I would say that the, if you look at the AD team or the director's team, you have your first assistant director. Do we have anyone in here that has AD before? Okay. Um, and do you, do you um, want to share, like as an AD, what, what is, uh, would you say, what would you, if I'm not putting you on the spot too much, like what would you say your main responsibility is? Well, all right, well, it was basically to make sure everything was ready to go, right? Literally ready to go, nobody's walking, nobody's talking, everything is off when it needs to be off, the cars are in place, this one is there, so that the director knows he's just has to say action, you know, and everybody has to know what they're doing. So when I say, okay, that's it, quite that's it, blah, blah, blah. Perfect, you're hired, I wanna talk to you. <laughs> I hire you, you know, you got it down. That's absolutely right, if you think about it, the director, what, another thing that I think all the positions really need to do is to create an environment so that the director doesn't have to work worry about any of the logistics. So the AD really is that main buffer between the director and all of the other positions. Nobody should be going, the number of times that I've been on a set that, and, and, and to back up, the producer is the one that needs to shield that director from having to any of the drama or the chaos that might be going on on set. Like we've had times where we've almost, an actor we weren't sure was gonna show up to set on time because there was a bunch of drama behind the scenes. Somebody wouldn't come out of their trailer. Um, we were losing a location and found out that like we didn't have the keys. So all of those things, like I've gotten to the end of a day and I've been like, so you know, da da da, this happened and the director's like, wait a second. I didn't know that was happening. Why, why, didn't, why didn't anyone tell me? How did I not know? I'm like, that's my job, is to make sure that you don't know because if it doesn't ever, if it doesn't pose a problem, there's absolutely no reason for the director to worry about it. Like, it's your job to shield them because they need to be in their creative head. And so, again, the producer is probably the main person to kind of shield them, but all the other departments shouldn't be constantly running. Sure, and I like that, well, with the producer, a lot of times, because I'm either the assistant director and the line producer, I have to kind of deal with the, the managing of the budget, um, dealing with any issues that happens on set to be able to protect the director as well. Um, but I kind of like the advantage being on the ground and being so close to the cast, the crew, and with the emergencies to be able to protect um, whatever is causing any sort of hiccups on the ground. Um, so being able to kind of work those two roles help, and of course being the, the what is also important locally here is having the paperwork. Um, a lot of times uh, the, the concern is that the ladies don't have the right paperwork um, to be able to know what is needed to distribute to each department. And we have to be able to make sure that we're all sharing the same information. We're on the same page so that when we get to set, you know, everything is, everyone already knows in advance what's needed for each scene. So that's important as well. Yeah. Communication between all of the crew members right, is yeah. super, super key. So, and so the AD, to get back to that, is really the liaison between the director and the rest of the crew and making sure that the director's vision of what the director needs is, is in place. Um, and if you are working on a small crew, that AD might also be your second AD and your second, second AD. So that means that they're also responsible. Your second AD is the one that usually is preparing your call sheets and um, the logistics for the day, make sure everyone knows where they are going and what that schedule is looking like. And the AD is also the one that's preparing your schedule. So they'll look at, okay, they're very familiar with, this is what the director wants, these are the things that I have to do and put in place in order for, for them to be able to work efficiently. Um, so that would be the second AD is, is the paperwork, and then the second second is kind of um, the go between between the talent, making sure the talent is on set. Did somebody say coffee? <laughs> getting getting the coffee. <laughs> That's what every position. It's like getting somebody coffee. Um, in addition to getting coffee, the second second, you know, is is making sure that the the talent normally are that they're in their their tent 
or their trailer or their little holding room wherever they're getting ready for their role that they are being escorted to set or they know where they need to be and what time and, and it's kind of that that liaison um, also too um, it's background talent you know your director in an ideal world should be able to co will convey what they want with the background but they're going to be focused on performances usually from your main talent so while they're focused on that it's your the rest of your AD department that's going to coordinate and get the extras together and say hey okay, I want you to start over here and then you're going to walk over there and every time we say cut you're going to go back over there and then I, you know so they're going to kind of coordinate the logistics of the, the background talent so that the director can focus on on the main talent but again really helping the director's vision come to fruition um, the experience we have with that I think would have been with Basidi, which was I think two years ago we had a really big um, it was a scene where we needed at least 150 extras so we were able to well we had the first AD and then I was the second AD on that film we had a third AD, we had a fourth AD, well, Canadian, and then we went up to Tag, which is the trailer um, assistant director. So the first AD who will be dealing directly with, blazing directly with the director and the main cast, and the second AD, of course, um, I was mostly offset dealing with the call sheet. Um, anything that came up, we had a lot of weather concerns, so I had to keep checking the weather to say, okay, well, you know, we have a bit of a, maybe like a drizzle in the next two hours, I was constantly updating the first AD on the weather so she could kind of see what she would want to do next. The third AD was dealing with the extras on set, um, the additional to say, well, you know, okay, guys, we stand by, we all have a 10 minute relax, but stay right here, don't move. Please don't let your extras leave set. Like, seriously, um, if you need to hire a production assistant to stay with them, um, if, they want, if you want to get food, maybe we can bring the food or bring the snacks in the holding area. Um, it will be a nightmare if a crucial extra ran away down the street for something and you, you didn't know. So as 80s, our job is to make sure that everything is ready um, for when the director wants to do something, he's available. Um, everyone is available. And the third or the third or the fourth 80, um, their job is to stay right where the glam squad is. Um, if we have trailers, then their job is to say, okay, um, this person is going through wardrobe, it's going to take 10, 15 minutes. They will update. Um, us on the walkie, so we have our own channel to say, okay, well, um, so and so is going to take 10 minutes we, to get to set. So we will say, okay, so and so is traveling in 10. So the first 80 is away, so that everything is kind of a machine in that whole 80 department where we're managing on set and off set. And again, in a smaller production, you might have to combine those. And I think that if you are combining roles, and maybe you just have someone like your mother that is going to coordinate extras, I think. Another, another way to consolidate is if you bring in that AD department would be a natural um, consolidation to have that team coordinate the extras as well since they're coordinating them on set. Um, and then, you know, I think going from that position, another really integral role right at the top is your script supervisor, which, you know, in when I was first starting out, that was a position that people were just forgetting about. Like, they were not having a script supervisor on set. And even short films forget about a script supervisor. Have a script supervisor, have someone, because that is key to making sure that your end product is something that... Um, <laughs> I, can, um, I can give an example of, of the importance of the script supervisor, where it was a very young director just came out of school, the mom had a lot of money, so she just gave him money to make his feature film. And uh, he was breaking the, the invisible line a lot, or even as simple as- You need to find invisible line, do they? Yeah, yeah. Understand yeah. What that is? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> so, so if you're filming, uh, if you're filming, it's all, so if you're filming and you're on one side, so he says on one side, he's on the next side, and then the one is he's broken, so now when we see the next pickup, you're on the other side. So it's like, wasn't she on that side? Um, so simple things like that, or even if the, if the cast is leaving screen left um, for the next scene, how are they coming in? The scripty is able to then tell you, okay, no, the last shot they left this way, um, they should come in this way, or just little details like that um, to make sure that the story is still running in order. Well, and the, so the really one of the most important things for the script supervisor is continuity. 
um, is making sure, because again, the director is gonna be focused on the performances and that overall vision, and they're not paying attention often to the little minute details. And we say details, it's like, we had an actress that just had this habit of switching, like nervously, the ring from one hand, like one finger to another, and she was constantly doing that. So the script supervisor, I mean, has notes of what hand were they picking that up in, you know? Where was their hair? Was it over their shoulder? Like, and that's from the actual actor themselves to the, the surroundings, um, which is super, super key. I mean, we, the, when I did the um, J.D. Salinger project, our actress had forgotten to put her headband on, which was very prominent in all of the scenes, and we shot out half a day without her headband. And we literally had to go back and look at the, the daily, so to speak. We had to go back and look at the shots on the camera to determine whether or not people were noticing and we could get away with it or we were gonna have to go back and shoot. So, I mean, that was a day that the script supervisor did not have a good day because it was like a major, you know, yeah, mess. You don't have to shoot it over. We did not. So if you watch the movie, you'll see it. But like sometimes you just have to make the ultimate decisions of like, is it worth it? And in that case, we actually showed it to several people and nobody noticed and we were like, like right away on set. And we were like, or DIT were like, so watch this. Anything wrong with that? Anything wrong with that? Okay, I think we can go. Yeah. Uh, a really good example of that, we did a short film. We could not afford a script supervisor, so we're kind of like doubling up and doing that. And now I'm in post and I'm looking at one of the shots. The actress, the chain is not visible. And then the next shot, the chain is there. I'm like, oh my God. But I like the shot, so I'm like, you know what? We love, we'll, we'll chalk it up to, you know, as a, one of the blooper Easter eggs maybe afterwards. But the, that's the importance of the script supervisor. You might think you're so on the ball, but the script supervisor is taking shots and logging it and then sending notes. And as the AD department, I should note, um, every evening the script supervisor sends um, me notes, the second AD, and I have to do a daily production report that then gets sent to the producers to see what would have been, what happened that day. Um, we make notes on if maybe the generator um, didn't work or if I've had script notes where a tarantula was on set or just a lot of crazy things. Um, but you're really noting things that maybe would have cost money, um, maybe would have slowed down production. So we know how to fix it uh, for the next day to make sure to keep the production running on schedule. Yeah, and again, it's, it's just that additional eyes for the director. And they're also there to make notes on, like, if there was a shot that went really, really well and was definitely the director's favorite from a performance, they'll note it. So that when you go back into the edit, when you go to edit, you have an idea of what the best shots were. And again, what you did capture or did not capture in that scene. So that's, we could go on and on, I think, about the script supervisor because it's so important. But, you know, even if it's somebody who's not trained, if you don't have the ability to do it, it's someone that you sit down and kind of point out everything that they should be watching, you know, for. And you know, use a camera, use a camera and take pictures. I don't I'm gonna jump because I also think it's important to say that continuity also should be tracked in an ideal world from your other departments. I was gonna ask yeah. that there is the overlap happen between the department and the script supervisor, right? Like that's a good so a headband is at the top of the water, right? Like technically speaking, you're like, how do you, so not so much that you're looking to lay blame, but you want to make sure, like, who's the end person that should really catch it, right? So your head of department should be keeping an eye, and if it escapes them, then script supervisor will hopefully catch it, right? Yeah. Isn't that how it should go? Exactly, exactly. Okay. So you're, let's take the most obvious, which are hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. You know, or hair, makeup, and wardrobe, right? Your wardrobe supervisor should be having a book, we, we've got a book for hair and makeup, and they're taking Polaroids, should, Polaroids, yeah, we do actually still use, no, we don't, we use, we, we do still use Polaroids, um, we don't anymore use digital. You're taking, you're taking a picture of the cast every day before they go on to set so that you could see their wardrobe, see what, you know, the hair from all angles, I'll tell you a story about that um, in a second. Um, so that you can keep that continuity so that when, you know, because you might have a schedule for a day and then all of a sudden you're like, we need to flip-flop scenes and nobody in their mind can keep exactly like what that actress had on and what world, like how exactly did we do our hair. So you go back to the continuity book, which your wardrobe supervisor, or if you're a one person wardrobe department, you know, the wardrobe department should be keeping those notes. Hair and makeup should be keeping those notes. And it's their job to make sure that the actor or actors in props too, everything is there that needs to be there. 
But then the Lord, you know, is the hopefully your script supervisor, if they're really on it, would be that like second like checks and balances to make sure that everything is still okay. And then of course, you know, everyone uh, on on set, especially on a, an independent film, like always have your eyes and ears open and don't be afraid to to say something. If it's some if it's something like that, then it's I think it's always okay for anyone just to say, uh, wait a second, that water glass was full two shots ago and now it's empty and it's not gonna work continuity wise. Like so you have to have ever each other's back in an indie. And a lot of notes with your script supervisor with continuity, a lot of times you might not make it deep. So you're starting to think, okay, which scenes should we drop? Um, definitely talk to the script supervisor to see the importance of certain elements um, where you have to make a decision, okay, should we really lose this scene? Um, they will tell you, well, no, because in the next, you know, next 30 minutes in the storyline, this has to happen, so we need to establish um, this location or they have to say a particular line um, or can we use that line in another scene? Just talk to scripty before you decide as maybe the A department or the director um, to find out, okay, how feasible is it to, to cut certain scenes if you have to? Very important. Yeah. And I wouldn't hesitate to on a, a smaller budget film. You know, you don't ever want to stress your actors out. Like, I think our job too as crew members is to everybody let uh, give everyone a, an environment so they feel safe and they can do what they're there to do best and not worry about anything else. But if you're on an indie, you know, it doesn't hurt before your actor or actress goes on set to say, okay, do you have everything? We've got all, you know, I'm just doing a double check. You've got jewelry, hair, makeup, you know, just, just go through it with them. And that's just one more person as a checks and balance. So to answer your question, each department uh, should be keeping a continuity log and then the script supervisor would be kind of the, the final. Yeah. Um, okay, so that is script. I'm kind of going through the positions on a, on a budget. Um, overall, you've got your location manager or your location department, which ultimately is the team that, you know, I even do this on mine. Like it, early on, you've got your scouts that are going out to find the locations that meet that director's vision and they bring back pictures or website links and then present those to the director and then if it's something that they're interested in and you, you know because again the director shouldn't be worrying about all the locations going to find them somebody's job is to go find them bring them back and then they're able to pick where they want to go spend their time and what they're actually going to go check out and see um, but from a, a location standpoint if we could go down a hole with this too you know you're not just checking out the location that matches visually but you know you're looking at do we have a place to park the crew cars? You know, where are we going to hold the actors? Like, where are they going to wait between scenes? Do we, um, you know, do we have a water source? Where, yeah. in terms of the sound, how loud um, are we near to our main road? Um, do we have access at certain hours? You know, things like that. But I wanted to just kind of go back to the location scout. So on the very low budget films we have, what we kind of do with the director. Um, this is way before we go into filming. We let them kind of see what location they might like, pinpoint it, and then we send out somebody afterwards to then follow up with that location. So we kind of it kind of saves time, of course, and money by them saying, "I like this location. Okay, good. Now let's follow up on it for you to find out how feasible it is." Yeah. Absolutely, and I think for indie too, what I always suggest is like when you're creating a project, like sometimes you create the project around the locations that you already have. I mean, I always did that on our. our first few projects, I mean, we were writing scripts around really great locations that we had access to. So in that case, you never even need to go through that process. You just have to do the, the follow-up. But like, think about the logistics of where you're shooting, like where are we gonna feed people? Like when we break for lunch, where are, we gonna, where, are there bathrooms? And, and really it's usually not that you're gonna bring bathrooms like with you on a lower budget set. It's, you know, hey, okay, so will we be able to use your bathrooms? There's a church next door it's gonna be Monday or Tuesday and there's no service. Like, can we have access to the church and can we you know, use our two or three offices? And you know, it, it's, it's thinking through the logistics of the location and what's gonna be needed at that location on the days of shooting. Um, and it's also, um, we'd like to make sure if the director isn't able to see the location or even if the DP isn't able to see it in advance, um, definitely take like 360 photos, do a video, 
um, you know, just spend a lot of time in this space to see how feasible it is before you even either say, oh, here's a great location, because as soon as you send it and the DP or the director says, well, no, look at the power lines, or they see things really quickly, so you want to really, really take your time understanding what the theme of the film is before you start just sending a ton of photos towards your director to bombard the director. Yeah. It's all that common vision, it all yeah. comes back to that common vision. Um, and, and you know, locations, a lot of things that you don't think of too, it's you've got your trash, you've got, like if you're going to someone's house, you have to protect it because you don't want to get a bill because you messed up their floors rolling, you know, camera equipment or sticks, um, tripod sticks. Um, so it's someone too that usually whoever's in charge of locations, and you know, even on a smaller film, it's good to have someone that that's their sole responsibility because it is, it's a long job. It's the person that's usually there before anyone else in the morning because you're laying stuff down maybe to protect the floors. Um, you're, you're have trash receptacles. You're making sure that when people show up, they know, the departments know where they're going. Um, and then at the end of the day, that's the person that is responsible for, I always do a walkthrough at every location. It's like when all of the location or all the different departments leave, and it, even if it's like five people, there's someone that's responsible for going back through and doing a dummy check. Again, all of the departments should be responsible for their own stuff, but you know, I as a, and I do it as a producer too, so I guess a producer can do it, is going through the location. Did I leave that location in the same condition that it was when we got there or better? But that's really your goal and make sure we did not lose or leave anything at the, the location. So it's a, there's a lot of responsibility in that department. Um, the, there was one project we worked on, was a huge house, and the locations department had to cover the entire floor of the entire house. Um, the clients, the, well, the homeowners were very um, demanding in the sense of they didn't want anybody to walk on the floor, so the entire, the entire thing. Now, that would then add to your cost of your budget, um, the time for the locations department or whoever is now going to actually cover this massive house, it's huge, um, to be able to now film there. So that is also something you want to talk about um, in advance of saying, yes, we have the location locked. Make sure all of these details um, you, you, you've spoken about because that was a huge cost to the production. Well, and, and I think that's key is the preparation, all these things that you're doing to prep and make sure that they're done and they might take a lot of extra time it's worth it because otherwise it's gonna be dollars. And if you don't have dollars, you just really have to. It goes back to our, our session earlier, is preparation really is, is key. So there's a lot in that locations um, department. Also kind of in the, the bigger scope of production, you have the production office, which on big sets could be like 10 to 20 plus people. Um, on small sets, it's one or sometimes the producer. But you know, keep in mind all the things that are happening behind the scenes while everybody is on set doing what they have to do. It's someone that is, you know, wrangling the paperwork, making sure that you have everything that you need, making sure that, um, you know, it, who's oftentimes that office or that team is making sure that if you do have people flying in, what are their flights? Who's picking them up from the airport? Where if someone has to stay at a hotel or they're staying at someone's house, like making sure that they have that information and the address and you know so there's there's a lot of coordinating that goes on even if you don't have an official office a coordinator exactly um and because well a lot of times i either also fill in as a coordinator our job is to, to liaise with each hod to find out okay uh we're going to make a stationary run do you particularly need anything um so each department will kind of say yes uh, maybe i need extra maybe batteries or whatever it is so you're always kind of like the, the hospitable person. You're that person who needs to make sure that uh, people have what they need. So when they come to the production office, they can get supplies, they're, they're comfortable. Um, sometimes even if you can't hire a travel coordinator, we're organizing flights for boyfriends and wives and, and you're making sure that they're, you know, just comfortable space. So you have to be, you have to have a personality that's engaging, that's fun. Um, that's welcoming to be able to say, okay, what do you need? And taking care of the crew, the needs of, of everyone on set. And if you don't have somebody doing that, it really can bottleneck in the end. If there's no one collecting the paperwork, and even if you have, even if you're on set, and let's forget about the production office and say that you're on set doing it, you know, get a plastic file cabinet that you can travel with 
that you have files for each day or maybe you have a file for the actors, you know, and you have a place that all paperwork goes and is coordinated so that you're not having to collect it from a million different people at the end of the shoot. Like that really has to be the person that makes sure you have everything that you need. All the releases should go to that person at the end of the day. Again, the releases are being coordinated most likely in this case would be like the AD department is probably yeah, gonna be doing them yeah. on a low budget, but like they, who are they giving them to at the end of the night? You know, who are all those, the continuity reports going to, the camera reports, the sound, all of that has to be given to a person like they are the office. A lot of times I'm not pissed and all these things come and then we have to make sure um, and keep copies. So I digitize everything one time and then I make two copies and I kind of create two separate folders. Um, just in case, you can never tell things happen. Um, and uh, of course having the kits, so I would normally have um, internet, I would have a printer, just little things depending, because because it's just me a lot of times, I'm on set doing everything. So printer, uh, internet, your table, just a lot of paper, just a lot of, and sometimes the crew might come to you and say, I need something printed, or can you get this for me? And you're really just that hub. Um, of collecting and then distributing, and if as a if we have a production manager in that case, then if I need, I would normally have like petty cash that I can then either get a runner or a driver to go and get stuff. Um, so I'm still also as a production coordinator, you are still managing a little bit of funds as well. Um, once when that is finished, then you can go to the manager. Um, so that's just a chain of command there. If like um, so, like an HOD may not need to go to the production manager if they need to get uh, garbage bags they can come to the production coordinator who may actually have that um, or send somebody to get it um, instead of doing going all the way up for something as simple as, as bags. Yeah, yeah I, I just um, did a short film early 2018 and we didn't have a court. I mean, I, as the producer, was the one that was responsible for everything that we're talking about. And I just had a box that I brought with me, but you think like I made sure we had tape and scissors and extra batteries and, you know, an adapter. Like think about all, all of those things that you might need in an office, like having like a kit, and as any any good, not like a good producer, but like if you really want to be a really on top of it producer, like have a production kit that has like you know an ad a prong adapter in case someone you know has to plug something into a, a two prong versus a, a three prong. You know, have a little mini stapler, all of those things, because again, you don't want to be running around trying to, to find that like a you know first aid kit on a small film. Who has that? That should be these <laughs> locations and eighties normally. Well, we have that, so that's how we kind of work that around. So, um, so that's kind of the office or the office person kind of. Um, and then moving on, I think we got most of the production going into now. Um, do you want to go into the electric, Jeannie? Or the the camera director, the cinematographer. Oh, okay, we'll go to we'll go to camera. Um, are do we any DPs in the room? Okay, so we all know what the DP does. They're they're the they are the camera man, woman. They are the person that's responsible for the actual picture and capturing the director's vision within that frame. Um, a lot of directors are very hands on and are uh, very specific about what they want to see. Others are more big picture and might not be as as um, specific and they rely more on their DP for the creative vision of this is what I want, the DP kind of is able to frame it up and show them you know, how they might shoot it. Um, you know, and uh, so I think that's the main responsibility in a lot of smaller projects, your DP is also operating. On bigger films, you might have the DP who again is more focused on the vision, the movement of the camera, are you gonna, you know, the director usually will say, you know, I want sticks or I want a dolly shot or you know we're going to use a drone or you know whatever it is but and the DP will help with crafting that vision but then there'll be an actual camera operator that will be executing it but on most indies it's the same person um, and then you also have your AC your assistant camera whose main responsibility is the focus and pulling focus again um, so they are working usually directly with the operator DP, who again is um, answering to the DP. So that's kind of the, the chain of command. And on a bigger project, then you have your second AC and who's got the, the clapboard and is making sure that that's filled out correctly and each take is logged and documented and is also, you know, grabbing batteries and 
uh, really assisting the AC and the cameraman so that they don't have to leave what they're doing to run across and grab you know, a new lens or a glass, whatever you want to call it. The footage, you might give it to the second, second AC to go to DIT um, to dump the footage to take it back to the AC. Um, so it, it depends how you want to clear that up, who's actually doing that running. But the first AC usually stays very close to set. Um, if the DP is the camera operator, then a lot of times locally the first AC will kind of take the camera off of the direct DP, rest it down, you know, just kind of be that support system. Um, because of how heavy cameras are really heavy. Um, the last one we did, the DP did um, handheld for 95% of the film. So uh, he was exhausted a lot of times. So he, we had to be able to now have somebody to help lift the camera off a lot of times. So and that's where the ACs come in to help with that. And if we're going to do checks and balances in the camera department, that EC is usually so connected to the monitor that most ACs that I've worked with are there to point stuff out on camera, like a booms in the frame or you know anything continuity-wise. So again, that's just another check that's um, that's looking out for that overall picture and what we're actually seeing within the frame and whether I mean it, the the DP might not be aware that something is out of focus. So the AC is there to kind of check that. And you mentioned DIT, um, which we haven't talked about, and the DIT is also part of that camera department. <sighs> So, so important. And I, I'm not being a tech person, I'm not gonna be able to explain it in its full, but like, this is the person that is making sure that you have everything backed up, right? Um, that the, you, you're, if you're shooting with the cards or whatever your workflow is, which you've hopefully determined in prep, you know, they're the ones that is making sure that everything is backed up, you know, they're they're clearing cards and getting it back to the camera department because you're probably gonna be working off of just a, a few cards. And also in the really low budget thing, you're gonna have to digitech. In the really low budget, you have the, not even the DIT, you have the digitech. You literally, it's your most important person because this is your raw footage and on the very small shows, you go through the card and then the card has to be, you know, downloaded and transferred to multiple drives so we have a backup up on backup. And then that card goes back in the camera because you can only get so many cards and that card gets erased. So that follow through, flow through is actually your most important. That's the person that usually gets his shit on the most because they're in some corner, no one gets them lunch, they all ignore that person. And then they're exhausted and that's when mistakes happen. But that is your raw, that's your camera dailies, that's everything, that, that's what all we're here for. So in some ways, we want to A, make that specific position, because sometimes in the cheaper shows, they put it, or you know, lower budget, on the second AC. The second AC can't move camera bags and boxes and things and do download the card and do the thing and do it properly. So it is worth paying for that position. Even if it's a stipend, it's worth getting a separate person that just is dealing with the downloading of the cards. Yeah, yeah we can't stress that enough. And you know, uh, I was on a project for a studio and I was surprised that they, with the time, wanted to just have a PA do that position. And we fought to, they were just shocking. I mean, this was this was low budget, but still like a legit project that's, you know, was gonna be aired on a, a major network. And that person was tw up 24 hours because it takes time. You need also to make sure they have the right equipment. Like they can bring their laptop, great, but that laptop might not be performing at the rate that you need. So it's worth it to get the, the laptop or the equipment that's able to download the footage fast enough to make sure you have several backups that you can get that card back. Because the rendering that'll happen and transferring those cards could take all night long and they're setting their alarm every two or three hours. To, is that, have you done this? I, I, yeah, there's a lot of head nodding. So you're up at three in the morning, you know, making sure everything, you know, backed up and then switching it over and doing it all again. So it really is a thankless job. It's so, so, so important because you'll you'll lose all the days you shot if there's somebody that does not know what they're doing. It's super technical, so you can't have a PA do it. Like you really need someone that can troubleshoot, understands drives, and making sure exactly. too that you invest in having enough drives, drives 
there on set. Have we emphasized how important this role is? I mean, if your footage is gone, it's gone. And, and then your budget's really in trouble. <laughs> so do not skim. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it does. I think we covered everything <laughs> with that. I mean, it, it's. Um, I would say a lot of, well, I have a horror story where the DP was supposed to be dumped in the footage because it was really low budget. And uh, after we finished filming, he insisted that he dump the footage, and the entire day was gone. Um, oh my god, we had to reshoot everything, um, and that's a huge cost. Um, so the takeaway definitely have enough drives as a producer. You have, um, you keep one as well. It's, it's something that I see the importance yes, of. Like, definitely, as a producer, you need to have that because that's where your um, it's going to cost you everything. Um, so you should have that as well. Um, and I would never do a production without a DIC ever again. And um, yeah. <laughs> well, when she says separate, it's like the producer in their car has a copy that is, do not let your DIT take all three copies. No. Like, it's like, you know, the president doesn't not travel with the, the vice president because yeah. if a plane goes down, you can't lose them both. Like, this is like your drives. Like, drive A cannot try ever be with drive B because you lose it both. Like, the country is going down. <laughs> so, so yeah. And, um, oh, there's something you just said um, that, oh, and so I think that it, a little recommendation that I would give is on set, uh, you might have a tendency or have an actor that wants to constantly, like, oh, can I look at that? Can I look at that scene? And so you're, you're going back and reviewing footage, but. I've seen it happen more than once where you didn't go back to the end of the footage and you taped, you know, you recorded over on a card. So if you don't have the infrastructure to be able to, to go back and make sure that you're not, you know, erasing cards or going over footage, like it's just best to not do it for that reason. Um, okay. <laughs> That guy, well, we're gonna stop there. Um, camera, so moving on to the support of the camera department, because your DP is um, also gonna have an idea of the, the, the tone, not only of the frame, but like the lighting. And again, this is all the trickle down of the director is gonna communicate to the DP, who's gonna be communicating through, through the director too, depending on, on the, bu the budget of the film and your crew, like what it, what is the lighting, what's needed to create the look that you need. Do you need to, create uh, daylight or um, sunrise or sunset coming through a window in the morning, even though you're shooting at you know, 1 a.m. or 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So your uh, gaffer, who is really the head of your electric department, um, on a bigger film, there's a best boy who is kind of their, their right hand. And then you have your electricians um, under them, and that makes up your electric department, which really is, you know, where are we gonna, if you're gonna set up this big light, like who's, do we have enough um, uh, power to support that? And if we don't, do we need to pull in a generator? And how do we, safety, safety's really, really important for this department, you know, you're dealing with power. And if you were here earlier, you heard the story about all the, was it transformers that were that were going down on Amy and like creating fires and stuff? Like you're dealing with current and having a trained electrician know where to pull from and you know what you can plug into what without creating a fire. Like that would really take your budget down. <laughs> so that's the electric is there the electric department. G and E is oftentimes lumped together, um, which is the grip and electric department. Uh, on a bigger film, you've got your um, key grip and then the grips underneath them. On a bigger film, you also have a dolly grip, which is someone who's very specifically trained and uh, really good with, with uh, the dolly, so you can get a very steady shot. Um, so like having that actual expertise, if, if you can, is great. But on a smaller project or a lower budget, you know, you're, you're gonna have to combine all of those roles. Um, on the smaller ones, we normally call them swing, so they'll actually work in both departments. Um, there was one film we did where the DP used dolly shots for every single shot. Um, so we actually had to bring on a, a dolly grip person who was just spending her entire day just building um, tracks for the dolly. Um, and, but that was a skill that she ended up just acquiring being that one dolly person um, being a dolly grip. So it really, depending on the, the, the shot list, 
um, you as a producer, you might find, okay, maybe I need to spend more time hiring someone who is very specific to something based on the needs of it, so you can decide on that. So that helped, because she was just building tracks while we were filming other stuff to come back to that particular setup. There are ways around it too. Is there's people that, that build their own, or you just use like a doorway dolly, or that things that don't require quite as much support. And I think that's something you, you definitely do on low budget. Is how do I get that? Like drones. My gosh, they totally change. Like you used to have to get an airplane. Like I have to like convince a pilot from the location that want to be a part of a movie and wanted the credit to like hang out of their window but like you know to like go, <laughs> to go up in a plane and like you know get the steadiest shot we could and then use a post uh, use a post um, software to try to like stabilize it and now it's like oh it's a drone like you know DP's gonna pack it in their luggage or bring it on set because they have one and you know you make it you make it work but um, uh, so that's the the, and, and, uh, the grip I mean it's it's your it's your muscles they're they're building they're you know uh, setting up um, your uh, uh, oh my god I'm totally blanking on the word hello um, blocking light oh, and yes. shadowing and what is up with it's the word that I'm totally thinking of but you know they're the ones that are bringing the apple boxes so that you can get some height sometimes on and after they might be standing behind a podium and use a little more height so they bring in an apple box in so that you can um, support so they're really like supporting the equipment and setting that equipment up and helping uh, the builds. Yeah, and they need to be fed very well. They're doing a lot of manual labor. Um, so we, it's always very mindful to consider, the even as an AD, what the scenes are, depending, especially on the low budget film where you might have two grips, um, dealing with a lot of the setups, moving heavy C stands, moving all of these lights, um, to be able to then work through the time and maybe like a heavy scene, a not so intense scene so that they have downtime. They can go and get something to eat. They can just kind of, you know, build back their energy to come back and do another heavy scene. It's very important. Yeah. It's a way to kind of, if you have, a, let's say you have, um, you're having to train some grips and, um, or PAs in that department. You can go onto the internet and Stage 32 actually might have this resource as well, is you can download a list of like terms like in the industry. Like one of the first films I worked on, um, we had a very helpful PA, and we were in a situation where someone's like, I need a half apple now. And we had this PA that like ran up to craft services, like, I need a half apple right now. And he like puts the apple down in front of like the craft service person. And it was the cutest thing, and like, but I'll never ever forget that. But like, help educate your, your PAs and maybe give them a list of set terms, and like, so that when they they, are, they can learn, it's only experience for them, but you know, they know some of these things and some of the, the terms and C stands and yes. the clamps and the half, half apples and full apples and quarter apples and, and all that stuff that, you know, I'm constantly learning. That's, as a producer, that's why you hire the people that have the expertise or know, you know, know what they know because then they can be responsible for making sure that everything happens to standard. Um, so that's Jamie. Um, you know, transportation department is something that on indie films isn't very big, but I think it's worth Noting that you know someone whose brain is around, and, and the office coordinator can help when it comes to cast and crew in your AD department can kind of or cast. You know when are people getting to set? How are they getting there? Are they driving themselves? Do you have to go pick an actor? Like you might have an actor that is a name, and that's that one person that you brought in. Like how are they getting to and from set every day? If it's a smaller film, I like to pick them up because then you know that they are going to get to set on time as opposed to giving them a car and trusting them. You know, hopefully you would hope that you can trust your talent, but you can't always. So like, do as much as you can so that you're not, you know, losing a couple hours because your actor decided to stop or get coffee or they just overslept. Um, but transportation really is like, if you do have any production vehicles on set, you know, they're responsible for making sure that if you do a company move, your producer can't, you know, you don't want your producer thinking about, oh my gosh, there's this, I don't know, what, what production vehicles on Indy here would they be using? We would have a, a van, a panel van for g &E. um, We may have one for locations. So we kind of put all of the, we might mix it with craft, um, the water, the cases of water, we have the tables, the chairs, the tents, so that'll be one, so that'll be most likely two vans if we can. Um, and that's pretty much it for the for a very low budget. 
Um, if it's really low budget, then yeah, that's it. We'll have those two panel bands. And, and in that case, what I know what, what we do on our indies is sometimes it's like Genie is going to drive their truck. Like on big productions, transportation literally has. Well, in the U.S., it's it's Teamsters, but they have a person for each vehicle, and their job is yeah, just to get yeah. the Griffin Electric truck from one location to another. They literally are, are driving the the honey wagon from one location to another. On Indy, if if Props does have a cargo van, it's usually because they own one and they're bringing one, and they're gonna let us use it for free, and they're responsible for getting it from location A to location B. But just have one person that's coordinating. If you do have any production vehicles, like how are even just coordinating? How are your um, picture cars getting there? Like if you have your lead actor's car and it's one that you're establishing as a picture car, meaning the one that the actor drives throughout the movie, so you're seeing it on camera, like who's responsible for getting that where it needs to be? So it's helpful to have somebody that is coordinating that. Right. Again, even if it's the coordinator. Um, on very indies, it's usually, because um, I might end up being like the second AD coordinator as well, I would then kind of deal with the, trans the movement order. So I would be very detailed and on the call sheet, I would kind of separate up the movement order. I would definitely talk to all of the departments. I would find, okay, who is picking? I like to pick up the cast. Um, I actually like to pick up crew as well or um, coordinate pickups uh, because I feel like that's very important that everyone is here on time as opposed to, well, let them find a way, which is a lot of times some productions do that, but then it, it slows us down. So I will put my best foot forward in getting people all together. Um, and then I would just kind of put out do very detailed transport notes with the picture vehicle. I would then organize who is bringing the picture vehicle, what time it needs to get there. Um, so that will be um, dealt with on my end. Yeah. Well, and a hack that I, I used to do when we didn't have transportation as a producer is I would draw a very simple like um, overview of the location, like here's the house. And here's the side parking lot, and here's this street, and this street, and then here's like the church parking lot next door. And I would send, like, I, at that time I draw it, I'm sure there's a program you can use on your computer, but I would say, hair and makeup is gonna be here. And then I would say, you know, parking is here. And I would actually give everyone a visual map so that on a bigger film, you know, there, there is a team, whether it's locations, yeah. or it, locations and sometimes it's transportation, like letting people know, like, where are you gonna go? Where are you parking? Locations, we didn't mention this, but they're also for when, when hair and makeup gets to set, and they got to get it set up quick. Like, what room are they going to? Where are they setting up? Where are people parking? And that's that's coordinating. So if you could do an overview map, send it out to everyone, and m insist that everyone looks at it before they get to set, then nobody's having to track you down or someone down to figure out where to park. You know, they're not parking their truck and then realizing they have to move it because it's going to be in the shot. You've already coordinated it all, so people go, they show up on set, they park their vehicle, they take their stuff, they get to exactly where they're, they're going to go, and then you eliminate having a person, one person doing it on set because you've already done it ahead of time and sent them a map. So that's one hack that you can do. Correct. Um, we, we really didn't mention that the location, so the flow plan. Um, so again, on really in the, in the if, if we're doing locations and we'll be in the 80, um, definitely doing the floor plan helps. Um, we put where hot set, where the set is, um, where people can park, um, the no fly zone, where it shouldn't be. Um, but that really helps and really gives everyone a clear idea of where they have to be and what times and stuff like that. So yes, that's a really, really helpful hack. <laughs> it's also, I sometimes I always want to do on bigger projects. I'm like, okay, you guys, just do this. <laughs> Just organization, prep, organization. Yeah. Just, is there a question? No, okay. Um, we'll just go through the rest of these and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, hair, makeup, wardrobe. Um, as we talked about earlier, we'll start with wardrobe. Um, on a bigger production, you have someone that's just designing the wardrobe, um, which is more applicable to a period piece or something that's very stylized, you know, where the director has a very specific look or very specific color palette that they want to work within. Um, that's where, you know, a project where having a dedicated designer is important. On indie films, the designer is the head of the department, their keyboard wardrobe, they're the supervisor, which means they're responsibility for <laughs> You've done that. Yeah. You're responsible for the book. Do you, would you, are you open to kind of share what your experience has been, just uh, what your responsibilities have been in the past in that position? Um, no, as you said, if it went to low budget, you design, but you also have to implement and you also have to manage, right? So. 
I mean, you take home stinky clothes after an 18 day sweating in the hot sun, you're washing it till 3 a.m., but making sure it doesn't get destroyed so it looks the same for filming the next day. Um, yeah, no, so the, to me, the ultimate thing is prep, like, without a doubt. I prefer, as, as you said, so much is going to happen on set anyway, that you make all of your decisions in prep. I also find it's much easier to be relating with the director further away from the start of filming because they're calmer, you know, they, they're not worked up, they're not, all the stuff has decided to fly at them yet. We can still be really, um, I like to get a lot of feedback at that point and then just take it off their hands so they don't have to think about it. We've made the decisions, I'm gonna back you up and you don't have to worry, it's gonna be all there on set, you know, but we've done, we're, pre we're prepared. Um, so yeah, so, but you just, it's in these, you have to wear a lot of hats and, and um, managing budgets and you have to get so creative also we're it's Trinidad so we don't have like the world's greatest shopping so oftentimes I mean you talk about your dad and mum my family is fed up of me reading their wardrobes for <laughs> productions you know I'm forever like can I, can I come over I need a, a blue man shirt or whatever but um yeah so that's it and then the other major thing so it's the prep it's the getting organized and managing the day-to-day -day. um I use a wardrobe breakdown I just think it's the most important document because there's no way to keep it all in your head. I literally have scene by scene, actor by actor. So if there's ever a question when it comes to continuity or we're prepping, wrapping one day where you're prepping at whatever hour of the night to pack, like wardrobe does a lot of work offset both before and after, right? Because you're you're breaking down from the day, you're prepping for the following day. So you're unpacking for a day, you're packing for the following day. So yeah, I will use my um, wardrobe breakdown just to make sure that you don't forget anything because you're exhausted and it's whatever all the night and you're trying to keep the whatever fix whatever needs to be fixed finish what needs to be finished pack it all up and get it ready for the morning to fit under really cold time and the last thing would be just what you said about relationships like oftentimes um actors come for their costumes before they even meet anybody else on set so you are often the almost the first point of contact maybe aside from the director or the casting agent right so I get asked all kinds of questions and I'm like, sometimes I'm like, well, you know, that's not really my department, but don't worry, you're in good hands, I'm going to make you look great. You know, you just kind of learn, you want to really put them at ease because as um, Lesian said earlier, the glam department is sometimes where the actors can be a little relaxed. It's like their little home on set because actors are doing a very vulnerable job. Um, and yeah, they need a little place where they can um, relax a little bit or feel they have something in their corner. They just need a little... Ego stroking, so that's also a big part of what um, wardrobe does, so I think that's about it. Well, we don't really have to add much to that. We have a professional um, in our midst. Can I? Okay, well, I, I was actually hoping to prompt you again because I wanted to know how you manage contingencies, especially if you're dealing in um, pre-production with most of the uh, getting the, the wardrobe organized um, well in advance. when. You get in frame and you realize the outfits, the, the director sorry, realizes the outfit's not working for the particular scene or something goes wrong, the outfit tears, then you have to maybe like redo what, what kind of contingencies you have in place, especially if you're a one man. Oh, you know, I will always have a, at least an assistant, right? Um, I've done one movie, just me, and that was fun but crazy. Um, well, the contingencies are she talked about that she has a producer's kit. I have a wardrobe kit that has everything under the sun in it for repairs, fixes, adding in. I also just walk with like two of those big plastic bins of clothing items just in case of anything. You know, you so you re, so you prep really well. You make you really. It, I haven't had it happen very often to me that something has hit camera and hasn't worked. Um, I still always have other options just in case, but I think you can mitigate that by doing your prep really well because you, you, you're storytelling with your costuming, right? So it's not so, if you've done it right, hopefully, unless something really doesn't work on camera because there's a technical issue, hopefully you've done your homework well and you won't run into that issue and you won't have a director who hasn't, is indecisive and, and can't let you know that you're, you're set and right. So, so no, you just, like everybody else, you prepare, you prepare, you prepare some more and then you bring back up. That's it. Yeah, I think I think that you pretty much nailed it. And also, too, she's she's managing a budget, right? Production has said yes. you've got a hundred dollars, or you, or you have a thousand dollars. That's part of the job again of a supervisor or the head of the department or that one person 
that's doing it is they only have so much money to work with, so it's up to them to make sure that they're they're managing that so they can stay under budget. Because every department ultimately, if they're doing their job, will stay under budget so that the line producer, you know, doesn't have to to worry about it. Lisa stays under budget. I love working with Lisa. All right, so I'm just gonna keep hiring all these She's people great. out of Trinidad to come over and like, Lisa is great. Anyone that stays under budget, that's like gold, that's so gold. I mean, I've gotten lucky, I have to say, but um, so we're doing, and I, I wanna point something out. Well, let's go on to hair and makeup and then remind me that I wanted to point something out about the vanities. So in case I do, I did forget. That's wardrobe, I think we're good there. Um, and we'll talk about if you have to combine all, all these roles on one person do it. Um, but you know, keep in mind if you're gonna if you're gonna do something like have someone throw a glass of water on an actor or you know tear their clothing, you know, don't forget that that department has to have doubles and triples and you know, really plan ahead for that. Um, and then hair and makeup run very similar similarly. And the point that your key is going to be the one that has to keep track of what the budget is for purchases. Um, that's and you know, I know people that will say, well, we don't need to purchase anything. You could get your hair and makeup donated. A lot of times a good makeup artist will call up you know, major companies and get it donated so you don't have to spend money on it. But there are expendables in every department. There's expendables, which are things that like Q-tips and cotton balls and like you can't return them. You're not ever gonna use them again. So you're gonna have to spend the money on those things. And I, I've made the mistake in the past, like on a short film, we're like, well, there's no budget for that. Well, either you need box Kleenex like there are just basic things that you need that you want to keep in mind but um, you know your, your main hair and makeup department not to like lump them together but they, they do the hair they do the makeup but keep in mind you can have the best makeup artist in the world you can have the most magnificent hairdresser but if they cannot operate under the fast-paced problem-solving environment that you're gonna put them in then they're not the right person. So I think in all, I think really for any skill, it's um, being very aware that the most crafted individuals also have to be able to fit into this environment and be able to do their job with the ever-changing and the pressure of this industry because I've had very talented people that just haven't cut it and we've had to replace them because they just could not perform into that environment. Um, also just to touch on the hair and makeup, one of the films we worked on, the actors had to be painted um, head to toe with a particular type of dye and one of the actors was allergic to the to the, the dye of the of the um, paint and so that is something that um, it went to the wardrobe department sorry it went to the makeup department and they had to now prep the actor and and then being able to now find the right items to wash off the material in a quick way to then prep for the other scene if it had to work like that so that is something that's also very careful doing a makeup test um, with the with the material or talking to the actor to find out if they have any allergies, um, a lot of those things in prep we, we kind of try and do like a data sheet. So especially if it's just me doing it, I would send it out to cast and crew. Allergies, um, what do you eat? What do you do? Um, anything we should know um, just to deal with certain things like that, uh, just in case. Yeah, that's a really good point. And and for all of those departments, I mean, we sometimes call them the vanities department. That's just the nickname that we often use. Them. Yeah. And if you guys do, but I think that, and I, I'm guessing it maybe was brought up in an earlier panel that I did not see, but this is your voice, the first point of contact for these actors. And the job is to make them feel comfortable because we're all self-conscious. And if you're gonna be on camera and memorialized, uh, you know, it's something you can't erase that all of the potentially the world could see. Like, they're gonna be very self-conscious and that's not what they need to be if they're gonna give their best performance. So again, just like we're protecting the director from things that they don't need to know, we're also creating an environment that that actor is comfortable so they can focus on their job. So when you're on an independent film and let's say, I mean, they're in the commercial world, lower budget commercial, I have a hair and makeup person that's also doing craft service and there are set medic. And so they're wearing many hats. And some of those hats are more business and more do, 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 go, 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 and more anxiety ridden. But like, you have to know that if you're combining all of those, that when you show up for the talent, no matter who you are and who's doing the position, remember that. Like, I'm here to make the talent feel comfortable. I, even though I don't typically do hair and makeup and I was just running around directing traffic and parking cars, if I am now going to take on the position of hair and makeup, even if it's just like spraying down um, flyaways, then 
know that your demeanor, show up for what you need to do in that position, which in all the vanities is making that talent feel comfortable. And you literally have to show up with a completely different demeanor than you were when you were parking cars two hours earlier or when you were making sandwiches for craft service, you know, if you're doing many roles, so. Um, sound. See, this is a perfect example of what happens on set, is people don't think sound is that important and they get left to the last minute and then it can totally, you know, jeopardize and sabotage your, your entire um, show. Sound is so important and it can mess up an entire scene if an ambulance or a siren goes through right in the middle of a very serious conversation. It kills the mood. Um, I mean, I, what I always like to say when it comes to sound is like, watch one of your favorite movies on mute and it's a completely different movie. Like you don't, the, the motion that is evoked through the music or that like, a, watch a, a horror film on mute without the sound. Like you're like, that's not that scary. And the second you start getting like the woo and the eeriness or the sound effects or the breathing, like it totally changes things. And a lot of that it is post but like capturing really good, clear sound on set is super, super important. So having someone that is, is dedicated to not only capturing the sound correctly, but um, in a format and based on the workflow that you've established and prep is, is super, super important. And that's one person that is really listening for, that siren might've been four blocks away, but it's still being picked up on sound. But unless they've got the, um, the comms out, hum techs on, and they're actually listening specifically for that, you don't wanna get into post and have a really like dramatic scene that you're hearing this this siren that you cannot take out. Um, <laughs> it keeps coming back and back and back. <laughs> so you know, on cue, yes. That's, that's that's my sound department. I asked for some help just to establish the mood. So, uh, um, but you know, it's it's those things that are important, like air airplanes flying overhead. You know, it's hearing the simple buzz of an air conditioner. You gotta get turned air conditioner off between right. scenes. Hopefully you have a PA that can stand there and turn it back on if it's sweltering hot, but like those things, I don't usually, well, actually I always hear them now, but back in the day I never heard them until I was trained to do it. So having someone that is very specifically focused on sound is so, you know, so, so important, you know? Um, and on a bigger film, it, or if you can afford to have someone that's just doing the boom, and then someone who's doing sound, that's great, but oftentimes in an indie, you've got someone who's got their sound equipment, you know, strung over their shoulder, and they're also holding the boom, or you've, you've mic'd people, but um, super. I like when, um, if you can find a good sound person who reads the script in advance, a lot of times you might find a sound person like, what are we doing today? And I don't know. Um, I prefer when they've read it, so they're on the same page. Um, as well as be, before you finish a scene talk, yes, we normally just say, camera, you have that, yes, please add sound. Did you get that? Do you want another take? As oftentimes we ignore sound, and then someone is saying, I, I didn't like this take, I heard something in the distance. Um, and we're like, oh, shucks, no, we're, and a lot of times the director say, no, 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 we good. Until they reach a post, and then they're like, shit. Um, also, um, with sound, because we're in the Caribbean, um, there's always a grass cutter. There's always a neighbor playing really loud music. So we always have to have at a location person on standby to say, can you just please like not cut the grass for like 30 minutes? We, we're constantly communicating with the neighborhood. Um, just like with that, where we wouldn't film here at all because of the hospital. So we have to be very mindful, listening to sound, um, being able to find the grass cutter a mile down or just a lot of work with sound. Yeah, um, yeah I think, um that goes back to locations too though, is when you are looking at a location, like spend a little bit of time there and is there a hospital nearby? Is there an airport? Like those are things that you can also scout. And that's another reason we talked about earlier, that tech scout, um, the location scout. I think, actually I think I called it a location scout earlier, but I meant like a tech scout of like checking out what sound problems that you might have so that you're not showing up on set and then having to work around it. But I like hopped on buses and like, re, like rerouted them while they shot. It's like sometimes you might not get an answer that the grass cutter is like gonna stop. But like you go over and you like wave them down and they're gonna have to stop. So if you can like stall them long enough that they can get the shot, like there, there are ways to do an indie that like you can get what you want even if they say, even if they say no. Um, so sound. Um, and, and you know, on a bigger film, there's also your cable, like the the cable wrangler that will be following them because there's so many cords that are coming with sound. But um, 
I think do you, I think we got through all of production. I'm totally. Oh, security. Do we want to talk about security? Oh, medic security. Just the importance of, of keeping an eye out for for those things. Um, set medic, super important for safety reasons. Usually, you know, it's not somebody that you can have on um, on a payroll on a smaller budget. What I do when I go to a location is I'll go to like the fire department and see if they have volunteer firemen or firemen that are off hours that have that training that they would be willing to you know donate their time and hang out on a film set and, you know give a free meal and then you know they'll be there with the actors yeah. so that and the same thing with security too is if you can get people to volunteer to do it so that you're not actually paying for it you know who's who's going to sit with the equipment at the end of the night or if everyone goes off to um, eat you know you can't leave expensive equipment out on the sidewalk so somebody needs to sit there with it so you know bigger films will hire security I mean, even on our, our larger budget films, lower budget, low budget films, we usually try to get volunteers or, you know, get somebody for free to do that. Somebody just wants to be a part of the project and the credits. And same thing with, like, set medic, like someone who's trained or someone who's retired. And, like, on some projects I've had, like, three or four people or someone that was there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and someone that was there Tuesday, Thursday, or maybe it's just one day to get the volunteer fire department to sign up. You've got someone there. I've tried to do it where like the craft service person is also trained, but the truth is if they're dealing with craft service and there's an emergency on set and they're, they're far enough away, it's not the most ideal situation. So if you could find somebody that's dedicated just to hang out, that's gonna, you know, is trained um, with the medic. Um, on some of the films we've worked on, we may hire um, a doctor if we're filming a very bush scene or if we have to go in the forest we would then have specific persons to deal with that. Um, not all the time we can afford that every, but I like the idea of asking volunteers for, I love the fireman idea, that was really good. But we're, it's, it's rarely, it would normally be myself would be the first aid certified. So I try to always stay up to date with my certification. And then we have like the first aid kit, um, the fire extinguisher, just little things will be part of the aid locations department. Um, we would notify the nearby police station, hospital, um, we would, I would make sure I get a number for like the doctor who would be on stand, well, who would be working that day to say we're doing a film, um, especially if it's a high intensity scene where maybe something can go wrong, then I kind of have those persons just aware that you know they're making a film, if anything comes in, it's persons from the film, and a lot of times they just kind of pass in just to see yes. what's going on, and that kind of helps, yeah. Well, and for safety reasons, if you're doing stunts or, or something that is risky or you're out on the water, do, do bring someone in. Now, hopefully right. you can get them to, again, volunteer. But um, you definitely want safety first above anything else. I mean, we've all heard this whole horror stories, the Sarah Jones story that happened yeah. in Georgia where the, the camera girl was, was killed because production was negligent on not going through the proper the proper chain of command and getting all the clearances and stuff. like so. Safety is always first, and that goes back to the AD. Like we didn't mention that, but like true, their true. responsibility, <laughs> and so somebody needs yeah. to brief the team at the beginning of the day of any safety concerns. If there is a gun, even though it's it's not loaded, like a gun on set, that they're just um, educating everyone and making very clear what the safety protocol is. And on your call sheet, which we talked about, the second AD does. You know, usually you have, and if you're not doing a proper call sheet, make sure everybody has on them where the nearest hospital is. Correct. Um, and all that information. So again, prep, the, the more you're able to, to account for anything that go wrong, the safer you'll be, even if you're on a, a skeleton crew. Um, so on just, I guess, well, let's open up for questions. And then if you're on a, obviously on a scaled down budget, you might just be your DP, your director, you might have one person that does hair and makeup and wardrobe if it's really, really small. And then you have one person that's doing sound maybe I mean I don't advise it necessarily but you might have your camera also being responsible for sound on a really 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 indie film but I would say DIT and sound are two positions that people skip on that I would not um, and you can combine your GE department like that's, that's pretty standard. combines a lot of times with craft or the EVs. Um, because normally the 80s, we still, have, we still have to be there first with locations to make sure we receive the cast and receive the crew. So it's a way and transportation. So it's it kind of like um, we're always like first in, last out. Um, if we have to lobby hours, depending on if it's an international film, then 
the AD role is now even further where you have to look time to make sure that if you have overtime. Um, so it's really certain things we double up on a lot of times. Um, but sound, single, DIT, I will, I've learned my lesson, never again. So we, did, we just talked about how important it was to take care of the crew that we just went through and explained, and then we forgot the one person that takes care of feeding the crew. So there's craft, craft, there's craft service. Very important. <laughs> very important. Um, and so on a smaller film, on a bigger film, you have a caterer that's on set, and they're prepping the meals, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and your craft service is, of course, your coffee, your snacks, um, you keep people well fed, well nourished, and happy. Um, on a smaller film, it's combined. On my first project, I learned a very important lesson: was you everything was donated, lodging, uh, airline miles, all of our catering was donated. But what I really didn't realize at the time was even though everything was donated and free, and we didn't need to prep any food because restaurants were donating it. Who's coordinating Correct. with the restaurants Correct. when the food needs to be delivered? Yeah. What, you know how many people are on set that day. What time it needs to be delivered? If you worked later one day and now we're going to start your second day later than you expected, like for someone to remember all of that. Oh, and also too, when you get the donations, when every single place that gives you a donation when you're in Southwest Virginia then decides that like barbecue, because you want everyone to feel like they're in yes, Virginia and barbecue's the thing. Like we had barbecue for two days straight for every meal and finally we're like, oh, this was just like, this free food thing is not working out well. So like, even though something is free, you know, you, you learn the things that you can and cannot get donations on or, or the things that are free and you think that it's, it's done and you don't have to deal with it, but like you actually might have to hold another person on set just to coordinate Correct. your meals. So um, those are just things to kind of, of think through. But yes, craft service is important. And they also need to, you know, every day bring ice and That's refill the water. So they're also working after hours. And if somebody in production is doing it, there's a lot of jobs here that we've talked about that have after hours. And both they're prepping, you know, hair and makeup needs to be ready to go as soon as that talent gets on set. And talent has to be ready before camera's ready to shoot. So like, you know, they're working earlier. And oftentimes you've got, you know, other crews that are working late. So you really have to think through what you're asking of people if you're combining roles and making sure that, as you mentioned in the earlier panel, like people aren't working 18 hour days because then they're just gonna be exhausted and you've overworked them and they can't do their job. So and even if it's you're getting a bunch of volunteers and a bunch of PAs and you spend time in prep, which we all know is important, to train them so that knowing who specifically has each delegated position is key so that you know you don't show up on set and be like, oh, I thought you were gonna do that. I thought you were picking up the water. I thought that, you know, I thought you were gonna be doing hair and makeup. Like designate all these positions to someone, even if one person has five or ten, not ten. And I guess a lot of times, or maybe that might be the next um, segment, the turnaround time is something that we need to really discuss locally. Um, so we discuss that after? Oh, yeah. yes. Let's make yeah. sure that we discuss it in okay. the next, because I, yeah. I think we're kind of getting towards the end of our, our time. Are there any questions um, about what we just discussed? I have one more question. Sure. Yeah, so we talked about the DIT, right? And that actors will sometimes ask to go and see themselves, right? But. So I'm just wondering what the etiquette on set is, because sometimes in the past I've asked DITs just to take a look at something. If my pictures weren't giving me exactly what I needed, I would sometimes review footage from maybe, I don't know if it was earlier that day or a couple of days before. Is that standard procedure? Is it acceptable? What's your thoughts on that? From the wardrobe department? Yes. I would say if it's something that's potentially going to hurt or impact the film later on, if the director is sitting in the edit room and realizes it and you didn't catch it, in my opinion, that's when I would rather that somebody do speak up. But I think that you should, would go to a, the producer and bring up that concern as opposed to going straight to the DP. It, in the same way that like, if hair or makeup or wardrobe sees something with a talent, on a lot of sets the director prefer that you that you go through them than going directly and talking to the, the talent. Um, that's, that's my take. I think you know if it's gonna impact the film, then you need to, that yes, it is acceptable. Um, if it's just like a lot of times the actors want to do it, and sometimes it's exciting like that expectation on set. It's like, listen, we're moving fast. We're not going to be able to show you the takes, you know, unless it's an emergency kind of situation. It's, it's setting the expectations ahead of time. But I would be, if you had a concern, 
that was legitimate that we were gonna see in post, I would want you to say something. And then let the producer make that decision as to whether or not you have time or can do it. And did you wanna add something no, to that? that's good. It's a really good question. Any other questions? All right. I think, so I would say, and I don't have it on me, but as far as you know, resources when you are crewing up your project, of course, stage 32, um, you can go through them to crew up and to find the team that you need. I also, um, there are resources and I don't have them. I know in the past I've Googled like crew positions and there is a, a resource, and it might have, I don't think it was Wikipedia, but I found an entire list, and maybe I'll look it up and I'll share it with, with Amanda so we can get you that resource. And I, on my first few films, would print that and have it and just share with the PAs and people on set, especially if you're hiring people that haven't done a position before, like kind of give them a job description and show them like how it's gonna work and what positions you're gonna be responsible for. And so that there is a resource to kind of like dig deeper into some of these positions, make that be what they're, they're responsible for. Um, any other resources that you have that you wanna share locally? This is, I'm thinking locally, what would be the best way? Um, I know Film TT has a production directory, um, but also a lot of times, I guess, just call who you know um, and find out who is the best person for this particular position, um, especially indie. So because I've worked on a lot of films, I know a lot of people who may be like, you know what, this is a good person, talk to this person. Um, it, the word of mouth and the reference locally is like one of the best uh, resumes you can have to work. That's such a good point because no matter where you're shooting or even if you're bringing people in, um, it's you're not just hiring. This is indie film, so you're asking a lot of people, and this comes with actors too. You can't afford to have a, even if it's like your dream actor, if they're a diva on set, like, they're gonna derail your entire production. And it is the same. I was in a position once where I met, this person had the most amazing resume and makeup ever. Like worked on all the big films in the area that we were shooting. And everyone said, you have to, you know, everyone kept throwing his resume. They did not know him in front of me saying he's great. I was like, I cannot wait to meet this guy. And I met him. I was like, no, there's no way. He, drama, this is not gonna be a good fit on our side. So I, I just, you know, just didn't call back or and uh, hire it. At the time, I brought in a line producer that kind of took over where I had started, so I could focus on producing, and did not convey that information. Sure enough, like the line producer's crewing up, and I get a list of who they just hired, and they hired this particular individual, based on the resume, not based on sitting down in front of them and asking the questions, and that person caused a lot of drama in the hair and makeup department and was uh, posed a lot of problems for us. And I, I, sh I share that example to say that it's not always just about the resume, especially in indie film. You're a family, you're working long hours together, you don't have a budget, there's no room for divas. There's no room for attitudes, and if people aren't gonna mesh, then there might be someone that's equally as talented. In some cases, you know, their resume might not be as supported, but I know that they can do it. And that's the time where you really have to consider the well-rounded crew member that you're hiring, not just based on your resume, because it could, again, derail your entire project. So that's a really good point. Word of mouth, check out people's <laughs> credentials if you don't know them, if you're bringing them in. Even big directors, like you find someone you're like, oh my God, they're gonna be great for our project. Call people that have worked with them. Are they great to work with? You know, look at their past projects. Did they really deliver? Is, is this the person that can pull off your project? So there's a lot more digging that you need to do with your crew than just seeing someone that's worked on big films that, you know, on paper, that might not be the best person. So.